consent. Consent. Go. <laughs> My guest today is Henry Gaiden. He's the screenwriter behind 2021's Netflix horror film, There's Someone Inside Your House. The suspenseful, gory whodunit is one of the most original high school slasher films since the first screen. Its opening kill ranks among the top 10 of all time. The film hooks you from the beginning and doesn't let you go until the end. The script is brought to life by an outstanding cast and under the direction of former guest of What's Under the Bed and friend to the show, Patrick Bryce. My guest is also the scribe behind 2014's science fiction found footage film with a heart, Earth to Echo, and the hilarious superhero movies also with a heart, Shazam, and Shazam Fury of the Gods. If you haven't seen these films yet, what are you waiting for? Henry, it's a pleasure to meet you. Well, yeah, I'm gonna if I can just keep that recording and play it for myself each morning. I'll <laughs> uh, thanks, man. Good to meet you too. Thanks. Um, I believe your father was born in Alabama, but grew up in Nashville, while your mother was born in, uh, and raised in Memphis. They both met and married in Tennessee. Your father became a successful obstetrician, and your mother worked as the publicity director for the Memphis Pink Palace Museum and Brooks Memorial Art Gallery for a period. Then yeah. you were born. You got they everything right. She was born in Nashville and raised in Nashville. That's oh, the only thing. I'm dang. impressed by everything here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they divorced a few years later and each remarried. Your father delivered hundreds of babies and your mother devoted years to her volunteer work. In addition to her fundraising and philanthropy, I also heard she made an amazing clam chowder. What were you like as a young child growing up in Memphis? What was I like? Um, well, I had two older brothers, but they kind of moved out of the house by the time I was about eight. So I had like this kind of whole floor to my house. Um, and I think starting then, I just, um, I'd always wanted to tell stories. I was like, even like, I used to be into comics and I would make little comics for myself, um, even like before I could like write fully. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then I, and then once I had this whole floor to my house, then like kind of my imagination went wild and I just started putting together games and like having people over and then, um, and then like also just became maybe not quite rivaling you, but obsessed with movies. Um, <laughs> and uh, and really just like went full nerd into all that stuff that I've, been, you know, cultivating the habit of buying physical media, which still haunts me to this day. Um, <laughs> I just got a VHS in the mail that I paid for um, recently, um, well, two days ago. Um, but I don't know, man, as a kid, I would think I was like, um, I'm I, like a mix of shy and creative. I had like a good, good, like, um, core group of friends. Um, and, uh, it really, it, honestly, my childhood was like pretty great. Um, my you know, parents were divorced. So like, that was a source of drama. And I was definitely like raised to be like the child of divorce where you like have to be a people pleaser. And like, that's something I've had to like slowly work out of my personality if I can to grow up a little more. Um, but yeah. It was, uh, I can't complain, it was pretty great. Um, What's Under the Bed is an interview show where I explore my guests' biography, career, and things that shaped what scares them. Uh, before the influence of movies, what scared you the most as a child? Was there like a ghost in the attic or a monster under the bed? I have the easiest answer for you. Uh, aliens. Um, my mom told me a story when I was way too young. I, maybe I was like, five or six, you know? And she told me the story about how she and my aunt were in a cabin in the woods one weekend and they came out and saw like a, a, a flying saucer in the sky and it was just stopped and hovering. And they said a small, smaller saucer came out and flew off in the opposite direction and then off went the larger one. I was like five or six. So like I had a window next to my bed. I always like looked out there thinking I'd see something that wanted to kill me or take me. Um, even as far as like when I was like in seventh and eighth grade, like track team, when I would go running at night, I would look, look over my shoulder like that old. I was still like thinking about it. So that, that, can I curse? I should. Yeah, say. you get cursed. Okay, well, that, that, that kind of, curse. that kind of fucked me up. Um, <laughs> and, I, uh, and so I, uh, and then, and this is a really funny story that my mom's family doesn't like me to tell, but this happened. Um, then later on, I never really got to meet that aunt because um, it was like my dad's sister and she had kind of become estranged from the family for a while. And when I finally got to meet, to meet her when I was like 15, 
I asked her, I was like, do you remember this like night that my mom told me about where you guys saw like a flying saucer? And she was like, she was like, oh honey, we did so many drugs that weekend. <laughs> and my mom was like a very straightforward, like conservative Republican woman. And I was so, I love that story. It made me happy. Um, what do you think about it now that the government has confirmed re- UFOs are real? Oh, I don't know. I've always been open to it being real. It doesn't it doesn't scare me anymore, you know. Mm-hmm. And when when she realized she had scarred me like around like seven or eight, she like tried to make it better with something that was that's like I think good advice. I was just still scared, but she said, like, look, if they wanted to hurt, if they wanted to destroy us, they would have done it already. And I was like, that's fair, but that didn't really come from me at that age. But I, um, I think it's, I, I'm, I'm open to it, man. It doesn't scare me anymore. How about um, you? I mean, I've never really been scared of aliens. Uh, I've always been really uh, open to the idea of it. Like, it's not even open. I'm just like, it's, it, they exist. They yeah. can't not exist. It's not like, like, and I know that can be like, oh, they're crazy. But honestly, it's, it's like, this universe is way too big for them not to exist. Yeah. I took a, like- a I took a search for extraterrestrial intelligence class my freshman year at UT Austin. And uh and at the end, like it was gonna be like, and we're all gonna build to like where there has been possible probable life and like have answers. And at the end of the entire semester, he was like, We don't know, but probably. Uh it was like, yeah. this is the whole class for that. Um, but I uh but no, you reminded me of like how this connects to movies. So like I I loved being scared as a kid, like maybe because of that, maybe for just other reasons. But like when I found something like the thriller video, Michael Jackson thriller video, um, like I would be like four and I'd be like, show, tell me when it's on and I'm going to run to the back of the TV. Like I would just fill my brain with that imagery. Um, there was a movie called The Cats, uh, called Cat's Eye that's adapted from Stephen King. Short oh, stuff. I love that one. <laughs> it's a good one, right? And so really I- uh, that uh it's weirdly enough the third story with the little gremlin on the wall was the one that freaked me out the most though i think it's like the lesser of the three now that i rewatch it but it's um it's really cool but so like that freaked me out and i don't know i like to be scared and then so like as you start watching scary movies and you get in your teens like you kind of get inured to it like you don't get scared easily like you get a little thicker skin and so there was a time when like horror movies just didn't scare me and then uh signs came out um when i was in college (laughs) and so you remember the core aliens thing which long since left me behind but then that movie came out i went and saw it and it was like someone took like a a scab and just like ripped it off and it was like this fresh fear i'd never felt since (laughs) i was a kid i came home to my like apartment i couldn't sleep so i just started calling friends they didn't know i was calling them to be comforted i was just I needed some other voices in my life because I lived alone and like from that moment for like even to now I've been like really really susceptible to being scared and I and I also really love it and so like I really I really like being stressed out by a movie and fear is a way of being stressed out so um so it's like that movie kind of opened me wide open which connects to the alien so yeah uh zombies are my problem (laughs) Really? I have a re- I have I had like this really bad recurring night terror uh from the first time I uh watched uh I watched Zombie Land and the Dog's Purpose and they did not mix well. <laughs> I watched them back to the one where the a bunch yeah. of like thousands of dogs die. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait. Do- dogs die in that movie? I thought that was like a so movie. many dogs. So many dogs die. It's this one, it's like reincarnation kind of thing. Okay. Dog dies, dog dies, dog dies, dog dies. Dog finds his old owner. And like, it messed me up. <laughs> Those two mixing messed me up. And zombies have al- always been a thing. That That's I, what, what's sc- what's the zombies don't scare me. Why do they scare you? I don't know. <laughs> That's the problem. I don't know. I think it's the lack of control. I, like that, so the again, idea of being a zombie is being what's a crazy. zombie messes me up yeah right so like not being chased it's like no it's, yeah i mean that's scary too it's flesh-eating monster trying to eat, eat, get you right. but that's the less scary part to me it's only scary because they might turn you into one yeah yeah i was like uh, i get that like they don't those movies don't scare me but i was like i'm i'm maybe putting some project together which i don't know um if it'll work out but I, I'm, I'm attracted to it for the same reason that you're scared of zombie movies, which is like, 
a first person possession story. So it's like not like watching someone get possessed, but actually like you're in the you're in the driver's seat and like with the person as they're losing control. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and I was just like, yeah, like the idea of losing that control is terrifying. Like someone else is starting to slowly overpower you is mm -hmm. really scary. Yeah. 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 Um, many kids are first introduced to horror through fairy tales like Hansel and Gretel or Little Red, Ri Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, was there a particular fairy tale or children's story that scared you the most as a child? No, there was no real like scary story that I returned to. That's a good question, but I, I know there was, wasn't really. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> Uh, the urban legend of Pigman scared children from wandering off alone and warned teenagers away from parking along secluded roads at night for fear of becoming his next victim. This boogeyman had the disfigured face of a pig on a man's body and was, was most commonly said to haunt Pigman Bridge outside the town of Millington, located less than 20 miles from your childhood home. Oh, Pig wow. Man was said to kidnap children and take them under a bridge on Epperson Mill Road, where he would kill them and eat them. After the bridge was washed, washed away by flood in the 1950s, Pig Man supposedly hunted his victims along secluded roads and took up residence beneath a bridge on Shakerag Road, located a quarter mile away from the factory ruins where this story began. Two smokestacks are all that remain of Chickasaw Ordnance Works, a huge explosives factory during World War II. The story goes a worker was horribly disfigured in an accident that burned off his nose, ears, and arm. He survived his wounds but was shunned by his friends and family. The factory found work for him until the plant was closed and disassembled in 1947. His injuries forced him to become a recluse and eventually homeless. As he grew increasingly bitter and angry, rumors emerged about an angry man with the face of a pig living under a nearby bridge. The rumors sparked taller tales until the pig man legend was born. As compelling as this story sounds, a little investigating it quickly reveals that the town of Denton, Texas has their own legend of the pig man of Bonnie Bray Bridge. Say that five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> About a man in the 1950s who was attacked and disfigured when he squealed to the police about a local gang. Angola, New York, has a pig man of Road Bridge in Hawkinsville, Georgia. There's uh, the pig-headed specter of Pigman Bridge, and there's even a pig man of Devil's Wash Bowl in Northfield, Vermont. It would seem this Pigman Bridge urban legend is a contemporary version of the Troll Under the Bridge fable, like Three Billy Goats Gruff. Did you ever hear about Pigman or any other urban legends when you were growing up? No. In fact, when you started, I was like, why is he telling me this? And then I was, and then you said Millington and I was like, oh, okay. I've never heard of that, but it did remind me of a real thing that happened in my neighborhood when I was growing up um, without a pig man, but scary. Um, not, a, not an urban legend where there was uh, just like, I don't know, like a third of a mile from me. Um, a family had two twin daughters and uh, their unbeknownst to them, there was a man living in their attic um they didn't learn about it until one of the daughters went missing one night um and then they found where he'd been sleeping in their attic for god knows how long um so the girl went missing she was kidnapped um they don't know what happened and then in, in the nearby church the one closest to our neighborhood um someone was just reading from the hymnal a few weeks later and there was like a note stuffed in the hymnal that said i'm in the basement help and this guy had snuck her into the basement of the church and had been living there for weeks. And she had, when everyone was gone, they'd come up and like take food. And that's when she snuck the note into the hymnal. So that scared the crap out of us. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. That's... She's, okay. She's okay. She survived and is still alive to this day. Wow. Yeah. That must be traumatizing though. Wow. Yeah, for them, for Goodness sure. Goodness gracious. Yeah, so that's our pig man. Woo. <laughs> uh uh speaking as a storyteller do you believe urban legends like the like those like or, originated from actual uh, like like pig man uh, originated from actual events or do you feel they're more likely part of some shared archetypal narrative meant to convey some broader moral lesson like a modern fable nailed it second one 100 <laughs> percent. yeah yeah they're not really based on anything yeah they're about reinforcing what you should do and how you should be. And yeah, goes back to the end of beginning of time.
Um, you were obsessed, as you said, you were obsessed with movies around 11 years old, and your parents gave you money when you got good grades. You'd spend that money on VHS tapes rather than candy, and I read it was around this time you knew you wanted to write movies. Would you tell me about meeting Tom Cruise, and what was that, and was that what inspired you to become a screenwriter? No, I was, I was, that was, that was in 19, what, when was the firm? 93? Um, so I, I would have so. been... 12. No, I wanted to write movies um, bef before then. I would say maybe even around like nine. Um, but yeah, that was just so cool because like it was my neighborhood. If you've ever seen the movie, which is actually pretty good and holds up, um, the neighborhood he lives in is um, his house that is about 10 doors down from my house. Um, so they took over the neighborhood for a few weeks of shooting and uh, and it was just like my mom knew I loved movies and she was like, you don't have to go to school and call in sick. And I just got to watch the shoot. I got to meet Tom Cruise and talk to him for a little while, which was wild. Um, you remember my name for days after, which he'd be like, hey, Henry, like we were friends. Um, <laughs> I, uh, and I'll tell you a story about what I said to him, which is embarrassing. Um, I got to meet like Sidney Pollack. I became friends with like the stuntman. Um, and I even got him to come to my school and like give a speech. And he like, caught his arm on fire in his speech, like with Zell gel, like it was, it was just so cool. Um, so that was just like a dream come true. Um, and the funny story about Tom Cruise is, so I had waited outside of his trailer with my friend Taylor. And then he came out with like, I assume what was like a bodyguard. I don't know, maybe it was his assistant, seemed like a big guy. Um, and we walked down the street about like half a mile to the set um, and and pretty quickly ran out of conversation because we were 12 year olds and he was Tom Cruise. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so into, into the, like the awkward silence, uh, I just said, he was married to Nicole Kidman at one at the time. And so I just said, how's Nicole? Um, and that's awkward enough, but his response, which is, it was even weirder, which was <laughs> she's Australian. So, huh? Yeah, I don't know. But he was very kind to us and very sweet. That's like some, <laughs> there's some, <laughs> okay, there's some prejudice in that, in that, in that. I don't know if it's prejudice. She's it's Australian. Just, no, no. I don't know. She didn't, he didn't say she's Australian. She goes, she's an Aussie, but. Oh, she's an Aussie. That's weirder. <laughs> That's odd. I, okay. It's weird. It's weird that a twelve-year-old is going to ask you about your wife, though. That that too. <laughs> uh, do any of the stories or screenplays you wrote as a kid still exist? The first script I wrote, like like proper proper, like I wrote a lot of stories, but the first script I wrote that was a feature, I, I wrote when I was fifteen, and I and my parents sent me out to USC in LA out here, and I got to do a thing called a summer production workshop where we spent two months. Every week we'd have a class and I got to live out at the USC campus at 15 and uh, and just you write a script. Um, and uh, that was the first one I ever wrote. And it does still exist. And I love it. Um, it's a lot like Hannah, if you remember Hannah, the TV show and movie. Um, and so, like, I think there's a little too much overlap for me to ever be able to do anything with it. But it was a it was like it was a, for like a 15 year old. It was kind of cool. It was like a story about. Um, a young girl being raised by her dad alone, like she's very sheltered. Uh, the only people she engages with other than her father are people that they work with. Um, and basically they they rob banks. Um, and he's like, he's raised her to believe that what they do is good. And, 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 to, and so far to believe, cause she's young enough that like when someone is shot and dies, like, it's not death it's like a gift like so he's she's like he's like warped her brain into like perceiving the world differently than actually how it is and it's about her um slowly getting away from him and finding the world and it was it was a cool story yeah but no not everything everything i wrote before i i came out here and really wrote the first thing that i think made a difference i kind of had to write to get there you know yeah. i um there are some geniuses i am not one uh who can who like right out of the gate write a script and it's they know what they're doing and it's great you know and uh and i remember my first year at as an undergrad my, a, a guy came to speak to us and i hated him saying this so much and i don't 
I would never say it to kids either, but there is a kernel of truth to it, which is like, you need to write five scripts and throw them away because that's what you need to get through before you can actually be able to do it. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. At least that's what I needed, but I didn't like hearing that, you know, two scripts into my life. I didn't want to be like, I have to write three more and throw them all away. Like, come on. Like you have to always be believing in what you're doing or why are you doing it? You know? Yeah. Um, who introduced you to horror movies and did your parents have any restrictions of what you were allowed to watch when you were a kid? Uh, I had older brothers, like I mentioned. So they, you know, they were just like, I mean, cause they could, they wouldn't want to watch my stuff. So <laughs> yeah. Like if I was, if they weren't, my parents were around, they'd, they'd let me see some stuff I shouldn't see. So um, <laughs> I got to like glimpse like lost boys in early age and aliens and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so that was like kind of through my brothers and then, um, but yeah, my parents, up until like age 12 were pretty strict. And then some, because of my obsession with movies, like I could just ride my bike to the video store and I had a card. Um, and so I just started chugging a lot of R-rated things after that. <laughs> um, oh, goodness. For high school, you attended- Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Burn it. <laughs> <laughs> you attended Memphis University School on Park Avenue. You were on the Dean's List your freshman year, freshman and sophomore years. You were part of the National Honor Society in your junior and senior years. You participated as a member of the Quill and Scroll Society, the French Honor Society, Vice President of the French Club, sad philosophies and the out and and philosophies and the you're getting to one i don't want to get to but go keep going you're gonna get to uh actually no i think i know exactly what what you're saying yeah what you're thinking of i skipped that you know what's crazy is i didn't even know i was in that club like i i i i might have actually just blanked that out in my uh in my memory but i uh like when i looked at my yearbook a couple years ago i was like what the because like that's not who i (laughs) am now and yeah but that's who my parents were anyway. So I was just a kind of, um, yeah, I purposefully skipped that one. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't just, worry. Uh, the school mascot was the owl and your athletics included cross country and track. Your government club ran. Oh God. R- roughshod roughshod over the other YMCA model UN delegates at the mid South model UN competition at Rhodes college in the YMCU YMCA youth legislature in Nashville. On top of all of that, uh, you acted as staff prose editor, then editor in chief for muse, the school paper, along with your compatriots, drew long and Beck Dando. Uh, what were you like as a teenager and how much of your high school experience do you think informs who you are today? Oh, I, I think a lot. I think it'd be impossible for most people not to be informed by their high school experience a little bit. But yeah, I, um, I, all of, all of the friends that I've really kept, uh, have been from high school. Like, you know, a lot of people go to college and those are the friends they make. Uh, and I've made a lot of friends out here in LA, but like the ones that I've really like kind of kept for the longest are, are my high school friends. So we, I kind of went to school with the same people for 12 years. It was a small class. Um, and uh, I just like, I I had like lots of different friends in different um, social groups and they never really mingled um, until the end of senior year when suddenly like they all were in one house together because we were about to graduate and that was weird. But like, um, so I got to like kind of, travel between different kinds of groups and uh and that was really fun I, and I always felt like I kind of put on a different persona for each um until they all met and hung out and thought I was the same person which was a really <laughs> interesting thing but um I uh yeah high school was high school was really fun like that school as many problems as I have with the philosophy of that school in some ways um really allowed me to like just create and and I got to like write and direct a play um and stage it um I was supposed to be this this guy I won't name him but um I was never an actor but he thought there was something in me that should be an actor um and there is a part of me that always kind of likes that and so he uh he was like I'm gonna stage play it again Sam the play and I want you to play the lead which Woody Allen played um and and would you be willing to do it? And I was like, no, 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 no. And he's like, read it. And it's a great play. And so then I was like, okay. And then as we were preparing for that, that student had a 
like a mental kind of breakdown and where his dad like came to campus and basically said, I don't, I don't, it was really weird. The dad was like, I don't want you seeing the girl that you're seeing anymore midday. Um, even though there's no women and it's an like old boy school. So then this kid um, who was great, but like in that moment took a baseball bat, jumped on his dad, the hood of his dad's car and beat the windshield in. And so he was expelled. Um, so then we didn't have a director. So then they were like, do you still want to do this and maybe help direct it? And I was like, could I write something? And they're like, yeah. So then I wrote this play and got to co-direct it with my friend Drew Wong, who you mentioned it, and also Cody Donahue. And because um, I didn't know how to direct. So I brought in two other people to help. Um, and that was like, I think the really transformative thing that like I got to, to see something like come to life and like you know I'm, I've never watched the VHS of it and I know it exists um, but it was just really cool to have like people go like some people came every night and were like emotionally moved by it I'm sure they were some were people were being nice you know like but still it was just really having that opportunity I think really gave me confidence. Wow um, at 16 years old you uh, as you said uh you at 16 year old, years old, you were accepted into the prestigious summer production workshop at USC, LA. Uh, you attended the workshop. You moved to Los Angeles to live in a dorm without a car and surrounded by a class full of people twice your age. Would you say you've learned more from the experience of being in LA on your own or attending the workshop? You know, I think I would be shortchanging it by saying I didn't learn a lot in the workshop, but I want to say I learned more by being in LA on my own because that's what I remember most because it was really only two hours a week. So the rest of the time, it was just like me here. I don't know anyone. I can't go anywhere. Um, and it was just kind of a wild time. Like I was reading scripts at, in my apartment. So like I remember reading The Graduate, even though I'd never seen The Graduate, um, which is a great script. I read Alien Resurrection by Joss Whedon before the movie came out. And I was like, this is going to be great. And then I saw the movie and I was like, this is the script and it's not great. Um, that was <laughs> an interesting experience. I, um, and then like, you know, I, I kind of went a little crazy because I was up by myself all the time. I was like taking like multiple showers a day because I thought I wasn't clean. And then I was like, oh, I'm itching. So maybe I should shower. Like I was like, I, and then like realizing I need to see people. Like it was a, it was like a personal journey in of itself while writing my first script. Um so that's kind of what I remember most, but I bet I learned, I know I learned a lot in that, in that class. Um, but I, um, I think more about the time in LA. Ha! Um, in an age of COVID lockdowns, bullies, and active shooter drills, do you think horror movies can provide catharsis for teenagers trying to process these real world fears? Well, I mean, I think the world's always been a yeah, look, you're right. The world is scarier now to be a teenager than it ever was. Um, but I think that existed. I think that was true before now. I think that was always kind of true. Um, yeah. So, and I, and I don't think it's really strictly for teenagers. So, I mean, I think, I think people, I personally use horror to process a lot, you know, like I, like, I remember like, this is like a dark story, but it's really interesting. Like, so like my mom passed away, like not long after mom had passed away, like I was still kind of processing it. This was years ago. And like my neighbor, uh, her husband was very old. And at, at some point in the day, like he had passed on in their house. So then, you know, the medics come uh, and I'm like watching, I'm, I'm upstairs looking through their downstairs window as like, they put his body in a body bag and like zip it up and they're wheeling it. And I'm like watching the whole process of that. And like, like unemotionally, but like, I was like, I want to watch this to see something so I can understand death. Like it was, a, it was like very unconsciously about like processing my mom's death and like what, what death is and all that. And, and, and that is kind of a metaphor, I think for movies, you know, somehow by watching people go through this journey can help us get through a lot of the hardest to face emotions that we have to. It was poorly articulated, but I think you get the idea. No, you're fine. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Good job on that one. You're doing <laughs> great. Um, I tried to figure out which movie theater you would have gone to during high school. Oh, was your go-to movie theater Winchester Court or Cinema Showcase? And what was your typical candy order at the concessions? 
Typical theater was actually Ridgeway Four. I don't know if it exists anymore. Dang it! Uh, <laughs> and 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 a lot of it was because our parents could drop us off, and we would mm-hmm. actually not go to the movie, and go to the hotel next door and like hang out. You know, so I went to movies all the time, but like that was like the teenage thing because like we could actually skip it and hang out with girls. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but Ridgeway Four, my my candy. I've always been kind of a sweet tart spree like the, t- the tart candy is not 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 so much the chocolate ones and and you know what i'm going to tell you and everyone's going to turn this video off after i say this i don't like popcorn wow yeah yeah we're ending the interview now i'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, it was great though thank you uh, yeah. <laughs> i am kidding yeah I, I like I, do, I just i don't know like cheese corn maybe i don't like popcorn do you like popcorn mm, i like popcorn it's pretty yeah, good yeah but I mean, it's meh. It's not. It's not the best thing in the world, but I I eat it. It's yeah. Not like I'm. I uh, get out of my way to not eat it. I get it when I'm at the movies, but like yeah. it's only when I'm at the movies. No. I like yeah. to seek it out. But yeah, I'm un-American. All right. <laughs> um. After high school, you continued your studies at the University of Texas at Austin, where you majored in English and film, radio, television. I read you said the three most valuable things you got from this time was your English degree, which helped you as a writer. You took Richard Lewis's class on screenwriting and worked at as the entertainment direct editor at the Daily Texan, which kept you in touch with what was happening in Los Angeles. What kind of student were you? And do you think film school is necessary to become a filmmaker? Absolutely not. Yeah. Well, first of all, I didn't go to film school. I went, I was just an undergrad and getting a film degree. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, no, I like you, you covered it well, like the first two years, they wouldn't let me into the film department. So I was an English major. And then I had to like, basically like punch my way into the film department. Um, And then by the time I got in my junior year, um, I was like, oh, I don't know how valuable this really is you know like if you want to be a director i get it like you need to have all the tools but like now that no that doesn't work anymore you everyone has the tools like at their fingertips now so i don't think it's necessary thing right here (laughs) that little thing can make a fantastic movie um (laughs) i um so no i don't think film school is necessary i definitely don't think going and getting like a grad degree at all is necessary anymore Mm -hmm. um and i uh but i but i did learn a lot of things like the English degree taught me to write um, and become a better writer uh, and also read voraciously. And then the screenwriting class from Richard Lewis was just like a godsend because I got to like actually build a script and then give it to my the fellow students and we all got to share thoughts. Um, so that advanced screenwriting course was really, really great. But um, I honestly think the the, my favorite part was being the entertainment editor at the Daily Texan, or just just writing there, getting to meet people. I would I was allowed to like interview screenwriters, um, and so like at film festivals, I would like South by Southwest or the Austin Film Festival. I would go like interview them, and uh, and it just gave me such an insight into their lives, and um, and made it seem attainable, you know. Um, and so that was maybe my favorite thing, and also like to my to to my detriment. It really, I I was a film critic for those years and uh, I'd always loved film criticism and it just made me love it all the more. And I just like, I consume film criticism daily. I love it. Like, like I'll seek any new, like, even if it's like, like Blu-rays, like any reviews, I'll just read anything. I love reviews. Um, And, uh, and then like when I make a movie and the reviews come out, I also want to read them. And then I'm like, no, maybe I shouldn't do that. (laughs) Like, only with this movie, Shazam 2, have I actually gotten to the point where I'm like, I'm not going to look. Um, but but I, I love I love film criticism. I think it's really necessary. And a lot of people shit on it um, who are creative. And I think that they are short-sighted. Uh, the Jester Center dormitory looms over the smaller buildings that surround it. Narrow windows edged in concrete dot its walls where students can peer out across the southern end of the University of Texas campus. It was, de- it was designed so its residents would never have to leave. We spoke about urban legends before. When did you hear the Jester Center was designed by a Russian architect who specialized in building prisons? Did you know that's a lie? I did. I very much did. 
<laughs> did, did I say it was? Did I did I say that in an interview? You talked about it, but you said this sounds this sound right. this is starting to sound fake. And right. then the, inter- the interviewer said, "Yeah, it does." And then you looked it up later. And yeah, that was a that was during was. the public. That's right. That was during the publicity for There's Someone Inside Your House, where I was mm-hmm. back in Austin because we were premiering um, at um, what's the horror film festival? What's the genre film festival? Uh, I'm a bad former Austinite. It's hosted by at the Alamo Draft House people. Anyway, their <laughs> festival, I forget its name, we were premiering at, and uh, and I was having someone like like do my hair and put a little makeup on because I was going to do on camera um, interviews, which I do not have the luxury of here at home. But I, <laughs> so I was able to look a little prettier. And as she was doing it, we were looking out um, at toward campus and I could see gesture and I brought it up. And then as I was telling her that story, I was like, that's yeah. Like I just told you, I was like, this, this sounds like I made this up and I've said it for years. And then we looked it up and it was a lie, but everyone <laughs> Everyone who went to school there was like, yeah, I mean, that's, that was built by a guy who builds Russian prisons. And we were like, yep, sounds right. It uh, sounds yeah. correct. <laughs> and it looks like it, but it's not. Uh, fun note, I came across an article about the, about this published in the Daily Texan there. And there was an advertisement for that uh, that movie right there. Really? There was an ad for that. That's Both wild. times I went to it too. One was lower down, and the other one was right there. It was right at the top, and I grabbed a screenshot of it. Oh, dude, that's awesome! That's really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> um, will you send that to me? Yes, I will. Yes, Please. I will. Uh, in the spring of 2003, you moved to Los Angeles to be a screenwriter with no real idea how to go about it. You landed an internship with Laura Ziskin uh, Productions, and through that, and through that, you wound up involved with the production of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man Three. What role have mentors played in your life, and who was Alvin, uh, Alvin Sargent? Uh, Alvin played a very important part in my life. Yeah, he. Um, so I got an internship at Laura Ziskin Productions. Um, mostly through my cousin um who had a who was good friends with her as Laura Ziskin's assistant so they got me an internship and I would say about two months into that internship I came in one day and all the assistants were gone except for one so it was just like empty desks were just empty um I didn't no one explained it to me I I didn't ask I just did my job and then I came back the next day and like no one was there and then eventually they were like they informed me that all the assistants except for one had been part of this like email chain where they made fun of their bosses and but by creating fictional characters so like Laura was a queen and there was like an evil witch who was another executive and like they'd made up these like alter egos for their bosses to create a very complex narrative of like uh resentment and uh and those emails were discovered and so once they were discovered they were summarily fired and so because of that coincidence they were like would you like a job um so total coincidence i mean i was good enough i guess as an intern to be asked so i took the job as an assistant and i worked my way up in her company um and they were grooming me to be like a ce which is a creative executive at a production company mm-hmm. um and i was you know as someone who loves storytelling you know, I may, maybe I was like, maybe I should do this. Like, maybe I should just like cultivate material, find the right writers. And, uh, and yet I kept like butting up against this like impulse to write. Like, I remember we had a book that I really love, still love that we'd optioned it for Sony and we were out looking for writers. And I was secretly coming home and like adapting it myself, like with the hope of like sh- just showing naively thinking I could show them the script and they'd be like, yeah, sure. Great. You get the job, which is not how things work. But like, so I couldn't like fight, I couldn't like push off this impulse to actually write. Mm-hmm. So Laura's husband is named, uh, was named Alvin Sargent. And he, um, he wrote like Paper Moon, which is a beautiful classic, uh, Ordinary People. I won an Oscar for that and Julia um, and also Spider-Man 2, 3 and other things. Um, but so he uh, was her husband. She, he was adapting Spider-Man 3 after having done 2. And his assistant was fired also. Um, And so they were like, do you want the job? And so I had to choose between kind of this path to being a CE or this maybe path to being a writer if I was the assistant to a writer. Mm -hmm. So so I said, yes. And so I I took this job with Alvin 
Um, and it was beautiful. He was just like, we became very, very close friends. Um, after that ex long experience on Spider-Man 3, I got to see it all the way from pre-production through post. And then we had such a good time together. He said, would you like to continue being my assistant on something that I've been working on for 30 years? Um, and I was like, yeah. And so he gave me this like stack of, I mean, like literally this tall mm -hmm. papers. A script is normally like, I would say this thick at best, um, this tall. And he was like, I've been writing these scenes for 30 years, but I don't have a story. Can you help me find a story? And so we spent two years kind of putting together this really cool story in the Spanish Civil War about these two American girls who find themselves in the middle of a conflict. And, um, and while I was doing that with him, I, I said, will you stop paying me as an assistant so that I can be a co-writer with you? And he was like, yeah. So I kind of like took a, took, you know, a chance on myself. And I was like, all right, now I only have a, I have a year's worth of money saved up that I can really support myself on. So in that year, we kept writing that script and I gave myself a year to write a script for myself. And then, um, and then ultimately that script landed me an agent and blah, blah, blah. But then Alvin and I, up, up until, you know, the week he died, um, we're very close, you know? So love that guy. Uh, yes, that was the best film school I ever got was just like reading all of his scripts and then watching the movies that were adapted, good and bad, you know, and talking about the process and how that worked or how that didn't work. And like getting just like, you know, just details about like, you know, Al Pacino was like this or like Sidney Pollack he worked with, like, and all these like great actors or, or Robert Redford. Um, and just like hearing that inside knowledge, just like the interviews with screenwriters I told you about that I did in college, like makes it seem not so impossible, you know? And also everyone's just so human, you know? Um, yeah. Um, Spider-Man 3 is also where you met David Green. You said in an interview, the two of you would make have these silly ideas when you turn into a script and he would it would turn them into short films. There was a short film with a ham, ham sandwich that every time you'd take a bite from it, you'd travel back in time. Sam Raimi was impressed enough with it to give you the two, give the two of you $5,000 to make a short film with Tom and, Thomas Hayden Church called Zombie Roadkill. Do you prefer fast zombies or slow zombies? Fast. I mean, I love Romero, but no. I mean, it, with the times have changed. You have to have fast <laughs> zombies. Like, do they do? Does anyone still do slow zombies? Yeah, people still do so, slow zombies. Do? Okay, they still exist. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm. I'm fully on board with fast, but I do yeah. think Romero is a genius. Have you ever seen Romero? I was just talking about this one. Have you ever seen Martin? That movie he did. No, I haven't. That's like one of the ones that I haven't seen. There's a 4K coming out in a couple months, mm -hmm. but I, I I can't recommend that movie more highly. That's his best movie, I think. <laughs> True. All right. Yeah. I, I will I will check that out. No zombies. Yeah, yeah, it's a vampire one, right? I think. Sort of. Sort of, sort of a vampire. We'll but yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Andrew Panay approached you and David with a story idea. The idea developed into the movie Earth to Echo, a found footage family adventure about an alien recruiting some suburban kids to help him return to his home planet. Within two weeks, you had a one minute trailer and a 15 minute pitch for the movie. You sold it to Disney and you were in production before the script was finished. It was a 28 day shoot in Southern California. Filming began in April 2012. At this time, Andrew Panay had already produced the films Van Wilder and Wedding Crashers. How did the three of you meet for Earth to Echo? Well, it was it was actually Dave who met with Panay. So there's a thing called mm -hmm. general meetings. Do you know what those are? Uh, no, I do not. Oh, great. Let's talk about it. Most people wouldn't, <laughs> I think. It's, um, so when you get an agent or a manager, right, and you're represented, they want to start connecting you with producers and executives at studios. So you kind of do what they call like the couch and water tour where you like go to people's offices, they give you a bottle of water, you sit on a couch and you like just talk. And they're like, and it's, it's, it's like a date. It's like, so where are you from? Like, how'd you get interested in writing? Like, blah, blah, blah. And they've usually, usually not always read one of your scripts um, and talk to you about it. And it's just literally like, it's not, it's not about committing to a project. It's about like, is this person crazy or are they cool? Do I vibe with them? If I do, that means I might want to work with them. And then they kind of catalog that for later. And then maybe something will come up years later and then they'll think of you and you get that job. It actually works out eventually. But at first I was like, I'm getting no work, you know? 
Um, but I did make a lot of friends that year that I'm still friends with. Um, so Dave went on a general with Andrew Panay mm -hmm. and Chronicle, the movie had just come out and it was a huge success. Uh, and at the exact same time, Disney had just put out John Carter of Mars, which was mm -hmm. a huge bomb. Um, mm -hmm. So Panay was like, I think I can get Disney to say yes to a found footage movie because look what costs this and how much money it made and look what John Carter cost and what, how much money it made. So he said to Dave, just literally, he was like, do you have any ideas for a movie? I want it to be found footage. I want it to be about an alien kids. That's it. No, he didn't even say alien. He just said kids found footage. Do you have any um, thoughts? And so uh, Dave and I had worked together he, so much that he like called me out that day and he was like, so this guy, Andrew wants to know if we maybe have anything, do you want to think about it? And I was just like, I was like so dismissive. I was like, I don't think, because it's just like, it's sometimes you meet these, these meetings and people will be like, like one meeting I had, someone was like, we're trying to like come up with a movie about an animated movie about camels. You know, like, do you have any stories about like, uh, like a camel that wants to be a horse? And I was like, what is this question? You know, like, so sometimes you get asked really strange things. So I, I really dismissed it, but I love Dave. So, and that night I was like, okay, I'll, I'll commit like 30 minutes to think about it. And then like within 30 minutes, I had like essentially a version of what that movie is. And then I told him that next day, and then he was like, great. We went to pitch it to Panay. Uh, he was like, great. Um, and then unbeknownst to me, two other filmmaking, like writer director pairs um, went off and kind of developed their own kind of short. Like we just shot a little short to give you this flavor of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then ours won. So then we showed our short, had a full pitch, went to Disney. They said, we'll buy it in the room. They bought it in the room. They said, we'll be shooting this in three months. Like you said, I only had 15 minutes of words that I said in a room. I had nothing on page. Like, And sure enough, we were shooting in three months and I was in a hotel like scrambling, writing pages, running to set, being like, here's tomorrow's pages. The crew's like, fuck you. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> this isn't cool. Stop doing this to us. Um, but uh, it was like, yeah, it was a really trial by fire experience for a first movie. Um. Writing is often done in isolation. How important is networking to make it as successful as a successful screenwriter? Networking is really oversold as something you need to do. I think uh, I think if you write a good script, people will find you. Like that's that's really all you need. You need to, you need to like have a good script, and then you have to know a, a few people who can like give it to the right people. You know, but mm -hmm. like. I've always said this in other interviews, but like I find the best advice I can give is like I wrote a lot of scripts and I never really asked for help. And then I and then that one I wrote in the year I gave myself off, like it felt like I was it's I felt like everything was clicking into place and I really knew what I was doing. I was like, this feels different. This feels like professional. Um, and so I, I knew all these people, but I never asked for favors. And so then when I had the script, I was like, look, uh, I'm really proud of this if you like it. I'd love to have a like representation. And so I sent that out to like 60 people individually um, and 30 wrote back, you know, 15 liked it and got back to me and handed it to people. And one of them got a yes, you know, like, so like, it's just like it, but people respond to that when you like, don't always ask for favors when you like have something that's worth asking the favor, like they'll read it. I still I hesitate to say this on your show, but like, I still, if a random person reaches out to me, I will usually read their script, you know, because someone helped me um, and someone helps other people. And that's how you get there. And you sometimes need someone just to help you give you like a little leg up. Uh, what are the ingredients for an effective pitch? Everyone pitches differently. My wife is a writer and she pitches very differently than I do. But for me, the most effective pitches um is to imagine myself like and this is the actor brain that I was mentioning earlier is mm -hmm. to like imagine myself telling a campfire story mm -hmm. so it's just like literally sit down and like tell the story in the most like gripping evocative way and 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 and, and almost like it's a campfire story and you can play different parts and get a little goofy and like you know like have voices like and just whatever it takes to get people engaged that's whatever you each individual writer can do best do that because no one likes someone to be like okay so act one the opening scene is like you know you need to like be looking someone in the eye and like 
your fun in the pitch can be infectious to anyone listening, just like mm-hmm. someone telling you a good story. Um, so before I continue, we have six minutes left and I'm barely halfway through my questions. Um, is it okay to go a little over? <laughs> Let's go a little over. You want to do it? You want to have till 410? Does that work? Uh, yeah, that works. That Let's works. Just keep going. Yeah, we'll go through. Let's go. Okay, cool. Um, I imagine you're a- asked to write on many projects that don't get made. I read you wrote a script without Alvin Sargent. Actually, no, you just mentioned it. Ha ha. <laughs> you wrote the script with Alvin Sargent about the Spanish and so uh, Spanish Civil War that wasn't produced. And there was a movie called Lore with the Rock that never happened. Is there right. a script you wanted made you wanted made the most, but wasn't also what was the unproduced script that landed you Shazam? That's the answer to the one I wish could get made. Oh, what what is, what is that? <laughs> it's um I don't know how much I want to say about it because it's the one that's every year close to getting made and never does. But Dave mm-hmm. Green's attached to direct it. It's mm-hmm. at New Line. Um, and it's how I got Shazam because it, it involves kids. Uh, it's mm-hmm. set at a camp. Um, it's a horror movie. Um, and uh, and it's just, um, it was it was it was a really kind of like an idea that he and I, it's how it came about it's really worth telling you so like dave and i like had all these shorts um and we'd done earth to echo it didn't really lead to us getting a like work together you know a lot of work together so he and i i was like i'm just gonna i'm gonna send two hours thinking of 30 movie ideas mm-hmm. and i'm gonna come over and we're gonna talk about them so i just like really really just like vomited ideas onto a page like terrible some were terrible some were cool like one I mean like god there was like one about like I'm just so, so stupid it was like one was like what about a silver bullet that turns you into a werewolf you know, like, it was like so many dumb things like that but I was just like it doesn't matter if it's bad or good just come up with 30 ideas mm-hmm. and then in there was like this one golden nugget um mm-hmm. that was immediately like this is really scary and cool and new mm-hmm. um and so we always had it. We could never find a way to sell it. Um, and it, it, what, at first it was found footage and we'd gone around town and no one wanted it. Brian Bertino, who's a friend of mine, was attached to produce it for a while, um, who did like mm-hmm. The Strangers and a lot of other mm-hmm. movies. Um, and, uh, and so it was just always floating there. And then I went and had a general meeting with Walt Tamata when he wasn't at DC, but he worked at New Line. And, uh, and I said like, hey, can I pitch you an idea for a movie? And he was like, we don't listen to pitches like we develop in-house. Like, we, that's not really how it works. And I was like, okay, but can I tell you a story for two minutes? And he was like, okay. So I pitched it to him for two minutes. Um, and he was like, yeah, we'll do that. Um, and so they paid me like pen, not like nothing. Like they paid me like peanuts because um, it was a low budget movie and I was no big deal. But then like, my reps were like, don't do this. This is a terrible deal. And I was like, I don't care. I love this story. And so I wrote that script. Um, it's it's been there for so long, it's never gotten made. But that script led to me getting Shazam because I, I captured like kids' voices in their mind very well. Mm-hmm. It led to me getting um, a remake of The House at the End of Time um, over there. Like it's led it led to a lot of work, and it's the script that everyone still talks about that I've written more than any other script. So mm-hmm. so I love it. Yeah. Uh, in 2021, Netflix released There's Someone Inside Your House, a modern take on the high school slasher film. It was based on the book by Stephanie Perkins and produced by 21 Laps Entertainment and James Wan's Atomic Monster Productions. Former guest and friend of the show, Patrick Rice, was brought on to direct your screenplay. How did you get involved with this project and were you brought on before Patrick? I was, yeah. We, uh, we we brought on Patrick once the script was in a good place. He had thoughts. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we adjusted it for him. But no, mm-hmm. I um, that came to me. So my speaking of general meetings, a guy I met in my first year of walking, doing the water and couch tour, um, Dan Cohen at 21 mm-hmm. Laps, um, had become kind of movie nerd friends. Um, we'd go see like things at the New Beverly Theater. I don't know if you've been there in LA. You should go if you haven't. I've been there, yeah. Great. Right. Um, <laughs> So, so we, we, we bonded over movies. We still do. We're working on a project right now together, but he sent me that book and, um, and it was, a you know, I don't know if you've read the book, but it's like, it's Stephanie's primarily like a, a YA romance writer. Um, 
And this was her first kind of like jump into genre. She's since written another horror movie YA book, which is really quite fun too. But um, so Stephanie had written this book. And so what was really cool is like she'd infused a slasher story that was really informed by Scream with like a lot of like heart and care for the characters, um, which for me, I've come to love slashers. Um, it was always one of my least favorite subgenres in horror because... I, no one cares about the characters only like the a level like slashers really present cool characters so um i really love that about the book um and and so but i i couldn't think of a way to really make it new outside of emotionally new you know uh and then i had this idea about like what if the killer is wearing like a mask of your face like, and then and the, this whole idea of the set piece is basically like killing you on the altar of your own sins. Mm -hmm. The last face you see is your face, like, like your real face. So like, once I had that with her plot and writing and characters, I was like, I'm in. So mm -hmm. um, we pitched that around town. Um, it was a, it was a really fun experience. Everyone was really excited. Uh, Netflix bought it and uh, I wrote it real fast. And then we were lucky enough to get Patrick. I, I'd seen his movies. I, I saw the overnight twice in theaters. I, I love Cre Creep 2 is like, I he loves Creep 1 more than Creep 2. I love Creep 2 more than Creep 1. I know. And he, he always hates me for it. But I, I remember like <laughs> Creep 2, like, I just like, there's a certain like feeling or mood a movie can give you. Like, I remember the first time I saw Pulp Fiction, I was like, mm -hmm. sounds dumb, but I felt cool afterwards. You know, like I, felt, I just like felt infused with cool juice. <laughs> and like something about creep, like really just like fed me a vibe that I loved. I just was writing on for a while. Um, yeah. So I, I love him. He's such a weird, weird, lovely person. And <laughs> I love those two things mixed together uh, and wildly talented. So he came on board, really responded to it. And it was kind of like to the races. Um, in addition to directing There's Someone Inside Your House, as you we were just talking about him. Patrick Bryce also directed the amazing found footage in the horror movies Creep and Creep 2. Is it true that Patrick is a giant who might as well stand 12 feet tall? Oh, he's so tall, man. He's just so, it's just unnecessary. He should not be that tall, <laughs> but he is. Uh, um, go ahead. Uh, you watched more than 150 slasher movies before writing There's Someone Inside Your House, excluding the usual suspects, Halloween, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Scream. What are the, th the top three most essential slasher films that require viewing? Let me pull up my list. <laughs> Do you mind? Yeah, you can pull up your list. It, you know, this was something I could answer really, really quickly when There's Someone Inside Your House was coming out. But ever since... Uh, it's sort of, it's sort of faded. Okay, so I just have a letterbox list. I'm just going to name some ones that I really love. Okay. 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 Um, um, sorry, there's a lot. I, I, thought Cold, <laughs> I thought Cold Prey 2 was excellent. Have you seen Cold Prey or Cold Prey 2? I have not. <laughs> you kind of have to see Cold Prey, which is good to see Cold Prey 2, but Cold Prey 2 is essentially like Halloween 2 set in a hospital after the events of the first one. Mm -hmm. But um, really special movie. I really mm -hmm. love that movie. I thought the Hills Have Eyes remake was astonishing. Mm -hmm. um, I I had House of Wax remake re recommended to me, and I was surprised that that was as good as it was, um, or as fun as it was. It's a little mm -hmm. junk, whatever. Uh, Maniac Cop 2, one of my favorites. <laughs> um, the more I watch popcorn, the more I like it, though I wouldn't put it in this class. Um, Uh, Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night Two, <laughs> fucking blast! I it. have, I, I, I own a backpack that's just like a bunch of like small movies, and Prom Night Two is one of the big one, like one of the ones that are like Prom Night. Have you seen there. it? I have seen it. Yeah, I mean it's it's like trash, but it's so fun. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, prom Night One is boring. I love Prom Night Two. Um, yeah. Uh, the Stepfather, that's classic. That's nothing new. Um, <laughs> I really love Christmas Evil. Mm, I yeah, I've heard of that one. I've heard it's really good. Really good. You should check that out. Um, this is not a great movie, but there's a sequence in curtains on the mm -hmm. on the uh, like ice skating slasher scene. Mm -hmm. like, it's amazing. I should send you the clip if you haven't seen it. <laughs> um, Alone in the Dark. I have that poster behind me. Um, <laughs> I saw. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Um, 
New York, uh, this is going to make me sound, I, I always feel gross when I say this. I really love New York Ripper. Um, it's like a nasty movie, but I really love that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, just Before Dawn's a lot yeah. of fun. <laughs> um i didn't like maniac as much as most people oh torso oh yeah i know that one i like that one yeah torso is really cool um and uh yeah those are some of the ones that i really love that's awesome um so moving on you're a cinephile and you have an encyclopedic knowledge of movies i'd like to read you the synopsis of three movies to see if you can guess what they are is that okay yeah, but you're going to just like, well, I'm just going to be found as a fraud now. Let's go. <laughs> uh, a struggling rock star, his psychic girlfriend, and a crusty old prospector stumble on an u- ultra secret government project involving space aliens recovered from a UFO crash site. After their, their discovery, capture, and ultimate escape, the mit- military use their resources to find this unlikely band of Hollywood desperados and destroy them. No idea. No idea. How deep <laughs> how is that? What is Wavelength? Wavelength, I've seen that movie. (laughs) I own the soundtrack. Hold on. Hold on. (laughs) Where is it? It's a great score. (laughs) I used that score in one of my pitches. Um, That's funny. It's Tangerine Dream. Yeah, so that I own that movie on VHS. That movie is um is wild. Yeah, it's not great, but it's uh it's got a lot of unforgettable stuff um imagery in it yeah uh, wow i did not know that was the synopsis of that i didn't know he was a rock star a uh, young woman uh, second a young woman is invited by her shy girlfriend to stay with her at an isolated english country mansion but the estate isn't quite what it seems and neither is the friend who issued the invitation yeah i love this movie it's got donald pleasance's daughter in it yep um i have the blu-ray but let's see if I can do this. Um, <laughs> symptoms. Yeah, there we go. Good job. Um, and third and final, a black DC cop is pushed over the edge when he's passed over for a promotion, leading him on a violent personal crusade against criminals, punctuated by feverish psychedelic visions. Did you like know I've seen all these movies? I did. I did know I did you like seen all these movies. you like follow me on Letterboxd? Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yep. I didn't know that. Okay. Yes. Uh, that's a great movie um, as well. Black Sploit- a really arts, artful black exploitation movie called, um, what is it called? It's the actor. He directed it. He was in Shaft. Yep. Um, uh, Christopher St. John is the guy who's, yeah, uh, who who directed movie. and starred it. Yes, of course. Um, really great movie. I can't recommend it enough. Wish I ever could remember what it's called. I can't. I'll give you it's top of the heap, but <laughs> I will get I will give you that one because you knew what it was. Yeah. You at yeah. least knew what it was. Um, so reviews for Shazam Fury of the God. DC is back, a worthy sequel. It wins you over with its character and energy. Super solid, super fun, and super smart blend of hilarity, heart, and heroics. A super powered sequel that packs a punch. DC's Oracle, James Gunn, even tweeted Shazam Fury of the Gods was a complete blast. Um, would you briefly, briefly walk me through the stages of writing a screenplay for a project like this? Are you like given an outline? Are you referred to a storyline? Is it broken out in a writer's room? How does it work? Well, this one was a lot of stops and starts. So I got the the mo- the week after the first one um, came out, they basically paid me to start working on the second one. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, look, we we did not write Shazam to be a franchise we just tried to make a really good movie so like you can watch Shazam and it can just exist as its own thing so we didn't have the obvious next step now we had the tease with Mr. Mind and Savannah at the end of the Mm -hmm. credits but like we hadn't thought about what to do you know (laughs) and so I um so I spent a lot of a lot a lot of time like working on pitches so I I I wrote about half of a draft with Savannah and Mr. Mm -hmm. Mind um which includes a sequence where like Mr. Mind like basically creates um, a breakout, a prison break scene um, 
just using his psychic powers and and Savannah doesn't even have to lift a finger or move. Like it's really, I was wonderful. I was so proud of that, but like just the more we developed it, the more it felt like it was redundant with the first movie. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's because the, the one thing that I knew, like when we were like, okay, what's the next story about? The one thing I knew at the very beginning was, okay, so Billy Batson is a character who's always wanted his family. He always wanted his mom and his dad, you know, and then eventually um, he finds that his mom doesn't want him, but he finds that he has the family he like needs at the end of that movie. Mm -hmm. So he finally has a family. And then the sequel emotionally will be about him being like, I'm terrified of losing. You know, that's, Mm -hmm. if I lose this, it's the one thing I've always wanted and now I'm going to lose it. And so, and how that can really sabotage his relationships with his family. So that being mixed with the fact that he has like imposter syndrome, which is something I totally have too. Um, like he was like, you know, I'm a kid. I don't deserve these superpowers. We were like, we went down all these avenues and then eventually got to a point where it's like, okay, what if we just create villains that are the perfect like manifestation of what he is afraid of? So you have this other family, these daughters who have lost their father because of the wizard's actions. And Mm -hmm. they blame now our character for having Mm -hmm. their father's powers. So they're this broken family coming to reclaim what's theirs. They also don't think he deserves the powers that he has. Uh, And so it was just a way to thematically create villains that best suited that theme. Um, Mm -hmm. That's that's how we came upon the ultimate villain story. But there Um, is a credit scene mm -hmm. that might have Mr. Mind. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I okay. Um, this last question is a Sophie's choice: two must die so that one may live. The movies "Picnic at Hanging Rock," "Until the End of the World," the two hundred and sixty-seven minute director's cut, or Joe versus the volcano. Uh, oh, oh, it's really sad. Oh, I'm I'm putting a bullet in the head of "Until the End of the World" first. Um, <laughs> that's easy. I I was I have I love them vendors. I sought that out for years. I finally saw it. Um, and it has moments that I'll never forget, but it does, just does not work as a whole movie. Um, <laughs> but fascinating. Um, Picnic at Hanging Rock is, am I doing this for myself or am I doing this for the world? Both. Okay, for the world? That is I, the first time being asked that, but for the, for both. Well, no, no, if it's two answers. If it's for the yeah, world, yeah. I, 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 gotta, I gotta kill Joe. Um, mm-hmm. If it's for me, I'm gonna take out Picnic. Um, <laughs> Joe is a movie that I used to think was the worst movie ever made when I was younger. And then when I revisited, I was like, I don't know. I kind of love this movie so much. And, and, and it became one of my favorites. Yeah. All right. Uh, is there anything you want to ask me before we're done? Um, what are your three favorite movies? Oh, good God. All right. We can't, this you can't is, hesitate. Just go. Is, uh, Scott Pilgrim, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, 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 geez, um, uh, Salem Slot, the TV movie. Oh, okay. Are you looking forward to the remake? I am very much looking forward for the, to the remake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. uh, have you seen, isn't there like a cut of the Salem Slot TV movie, like the long cut and the short cut? Isn't there like a two yeah, different Yeah. There's two different cuts. I per, Probably controversial. I don't know if it is or not, but I prefer longer. I've actually no. I think I think that is. I think that's okay. The, that may be. Yeah, I think controversial would be saying yeah. you like the, the ninety minute version or whatever. That may be. That may be the more controversial one. But, but is no, it hard I, to find the long cut? No, it's it's two epi- It's a two episode thing. On it's actually considered a, ser- a TV series on Amazon, but it's a two episode thing on Amazon. I've only seen the short one. Okay, I'll have to watch yeah. it. Each episode is two hours. It's not. It, it's heavy it's like a it's a lot of watching to do i wouldn't i never have uh watched that full thing in one sitting but i have right but i have watched that thing like multiple times i'm a big fan of larry cohen um mm-hmm. even when he's terrible which is often um but i, mm-hmm. I just love his style um and i recently watched return to salem lot which he did which mm-hmm. was bad mm-hmm. you seen it i Probably when I was young, but okay. I don't know. <laughs> um, good answer. That. Texas Chainsaw is <laughs> probably one of the best horror movies. I mean, not probably, is one of the best horror movies yeah, ever. Of course. Top, maybe the 
Yeah. Uh, I I say it's in the trifecta. They're not yeah. my favorite movies. Tri- uh, Texas Chainsaw is, but there's the trifecta of movies, which is Exorcist, Night of Living Dead, uh, yeah, Night of the Living Dead, and uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I yeah, mean, there's something, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, but there's something interesting, just like Martin, which I recommended to you, kind of falls in mm-hmm. this too. There's something about Night of the Living Dead and um, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is like their low budget mm-hmm. creates some, creates, I think, an accidental tone um, and texture to those movies that makes them linger and feel like uh, like a haunting nightmare. There's something about it, and yeah. Martin's the same way. Like, they, 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 I think they accidentally, just through the sheer nature of not having money, yeah. made something scarier. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre seems like a documentary when you watch it. Yeah. Like it's acted like a documentary and it's horrifying. But like, it's funny, like, you know, he always said it was a comedy. Do you know yeah. about this? Did like, he really? Yeah. He always said like, I mean, a dark comedy, but he was like, oh, he was like, I always intended that movie to be a comedy. Um, and I went, the first time I watched that movie, I watched that with a, a German exchange student. Uh huh. I didn't know Toby Hooper said this at the time. I was just 17, but like, yeah while I was watching it, the German exchange student was like laughing the whole time. Like he got whatever Toby Hooper level was on. Well, and I was like, huh. this, this German guy was like cackling. So that's why when he made Texas two, yeah. he, he leaned way into the comedy to a point yeah. that like, kind of annoys me, but I haven't, I've never mm, finished. It. Yeah. But, it annoys me a little bit too. But um, I love that movie. Yeah. I, yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah. So Shazam Fury of the Gods is the new movie. If you have if you guys haven't watched it, go watch it. If you have watched it, watch it again. Uh th- Henry, thank you so much for sitting down with me. This was a blast. Total pleasure, man. You were great <laughs> at this, and I look forward to I look forward to dropping and I'll throw it out. <laughs>